when you see the screen, Misha. It is fine now. It is fine. Okay. Yes, yes, we see the screen. All right. So let me then start. Uh, so today I will be talking about some recent work that we have been doing, uh, mostly at Skoltek uh, here in Moscow in the field of polarity and computing. And I will start from work that we did uh, in digital logic really using uh, polaritons as a system where you can introduce the concept of a transistor and then how you couple several transistors to make gates and really full logic. But this is really digital logic. Uh, and then I will move on to analog simulation where I will be talking about work that we are doing in lattices, lattices of condensates, lattices of vortices, and how you can use the system, first of all, to study very interesting physics, but also potentially as a platform for analog simulation. Mm -hmm. From here. Well, it should. I don't know. It, it's a bit. It is a bit. It's a bit slow. All right. Let's hope it won't jump yet another slide. So, for those who do not know, this is really where the lab is situated. It is in the Skolkovo Innovation Campus in Moscow. We started working here. In 2015, before this building was even there, designing the labs uh, so that we would be ready in July. You see here, they gave us the room in July in a holiday state. But already in August, we were putting our optical tables. And by October, January, we had everything running because everything was pre-designed and really set up in the kitchen of the building before the, building was ready, <laughs> before the lab was ready. And since then, we got really very nice results coming out of this lab with the first demonstration of polariton lattices as a platform for simulation, minimizing the XY Hamiltonian, the first organic polariton uh, logic gate operating at room temperature, and more recently, how we can switch this kind of polariton transistor with a single photon. So starting from the logic, uh, we are working very closely with IBM. We design the structures and IBM publicates the structures in their labs in Zurich. And, uh, uh, and this and these uh, samples that uh, are made in uh, IBM, the group of uh, Ryan and Mark, uh, they have been working on this for a very long time, and they were one of the first group to demonstrate polariton condensation at room temperature. So really, uh, with the one of these magic samples, we started working on trying to see if we can increase the speed of a processor going beyond three uh, gigahertz. So you will all remember, or some of you here will remember, that up to 2005, when we were buying a new laptop, it had a higher clock frequency. We started with 50 megahertz and we went up to 3 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz if you put it in a fridge. Uh, but really in 2005, we reached the first plateau, which was really the limit of the Denard scaling law that was allowing us to really double the frequency of the processor every two years. And since then, you will have noticed that every new laptop that you buy has more processors inside. You go from Single core, dual core, quad core, etc. So really, there is a, an issue with how you can make your processor fast. You can have parallel computing with multiple processors, but you cannot really go beyond some frequency, which is around five gigahertz in professional devices. So this ceiling, uh, if it is not lifted, no matter how much you scale up your supercomputer, you are always limited by computational bottlenecks in potentially one pipeline. Even if you have a million pipelines, you have to wait for every pipeline to give you the answer in order to compose uh, the, the solution to the problem that you have parallelized. So this is an issue for IBM, and we are working with IBM trying to see if we can use architectures of optical processors, optical accelerators, that would not be really uh, um, changing the whole computing uh, architecture, but they would be implemented in supercomputers where practically when you identify such a computational bottleneck, you have a very small optical accelerator, which you help solve the small part of the problem. So this is really why we are working with IBM in this system and the work it is coming under optical computing. So we, are, we will be using polaritons here, but when you want to use, uh, when you want to do optical computing, what you want to be able to do is to switch off uh, light with light. So if you have an optical beam, 
you would like to be able to switch it off with another optical beam. But we cannot, of course, do that. Photon photon interaction is very small. So you need to pass your light through some material. And the kind of nonlinearities that you require for that uh, are uh, exceeding most of the nonlinearities that we have in non nonlinear materials. And therefore, you would have to go to bulky crystals, which really makes scalability a big issue. <laughs> so, the ultimate long term vision that we have when it comes to optical computing. It is really to go down to the quantum limit to be operating with a single photon, so really 100% uh, less energy than a CMOS transistor, to have terahertz speeds, which is more or less 100 times faster than the fastest uh, processors, electronic processors nowadays. And then, of course, we will always be limited by the micrometer size of the optical transistors. So we will never be able to have the trillions of transistors in a processor, but we can have uh, devices which are uh, application specific devices. Yes, optical accelerators. Okay, so regarding polarons, you are all familiar. The system that we will be working with is one. Uh, the top line is hidden also for the audience, yes, in my presentation. So can we try to dissolve this? No, we can see everything. It looks like we can see the top line. You can see the top line as well. Thank yes, polaritons, liquid light, and Skaltech logo. Excellent. Only I cannot see. Uh, fine. <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, the, the because you need to move, you need to move screen uh, projector screen slightly lower, probably. I don't know, but it looks very good for us. All right, thank you, thank you, Miss. So we are working with microcavities. So practically, the system looks uh, uh, in the following way: you have two mirrors into which you can find the optical field, and inside this uh, cavity, you are placing. Um, an optical transition, which is resonant with the cavity. And now a photon recycles inside this structure, creating an exciton and the exciton creating a photon. And when this recycling becomes faster for many other dissipation rates that you have, dissipation channels that you have in the system, you enter the strong coupling regime. And these polaritons have been shown to be very good bosons. Polariton boson stain condensation was demonstrated. And here we will be using polaritons as a platform for what I call liquid light computing. So really this state of a polariton condensate it is like a liquid light droplet, which we will be using for optical computing, as I said, and later on for analog computing. I will skip the introduction since you are all coming from uh, the conference in Yerevan. And so we will have a bit more time to talk about the most recent results. So as I said, back in 2006, the first demonstration of Bose-Einstein condensation of exon polaritons in inorganic microcavities was demonstrated. Then in work that we did actually together with Alexei and Jeremy Baumberg at Southampton in 2007, we had the first room temperature polariton laser at, uh, in gallium nitrite in organic microcavities. And 2014, uh, 2013, we had the first electrically pumped polariton laser at cryogenic temperatures. And in 2014, we had the first two demonstrations back to back for polariton condensates at room temperature in organic microcavities. One of them really from the group of Ryan and Mark. And this is the structure that uh, we will be using for the work that you will see coming up. So the difference between a polariton laser and a photon laser, you all know, I will skip that. I will just say a few words about the materials that we, that we are using. Uh, so there are different classes of materials. So you have inorganic materials and you have also organic materials. And when it comes to the inorganic materials, the fabrication methods are extremely challenging. It took us two large projects and 10 years to make one sample, the sample that we are using now uh, at the Skoltec, uh, at the 3 pi facility in the UK. And uh, where, however, you can get really very high thickness, very good quality cavities, where you can see very long propagation of polaritons, et cetera. On the other hand, you have organic semiconductors. These, ha these materials have very high oscillator strength. Therefore, they are very bright. They emit a lot of light. It is very easy to work with them. They operate at room temperature and they have relatively less challenging fabrication methods. So in the last uh, 10 years, we have more than 50 organic microcavities and that give you a comparison, yes? 10 years for one, 10 years for 50. So, but anyway, the quest for the ideal material that will give you the high finesse and the low disorder and operation at room temperature still goes on and people are now working and you are also working with uh, perovskite materials. So, in the work that we are doing for polarizing logic, we want to work at room temperature. So we work with organic microcavities, as I said, 
And here we are looking for polarity computing and with a digital full logic. And if you want to do that, and you look back in the history of polaritonics, really the first uh, action of a transistor, which is that of a polariton amplifier, in inorganic microgravities, it was demonstrated back in 2000 at cryogenic temperatures. Then in 2013, a full transistor, a non optical polariton transistor, was observed, but also in cryogenic temperatures. And they could show here the group of Daniel Sambito and end door operation of logic gates. However, uh, if you if you really want to make an optical computer, you better have it uh, that has any way issues with scalability. You better have it working at room temperature. And actually, in 2017, when we were just starting working at Scotec, there was uh, a nice Physics Today review by David Snow and Jonathan Keeling, where they said where all the hallmarks of polarity condensation have been shown in organic materials, parametric scattering and optical amplification <laughs> remains elusive. And that was quite some challenge for us because we had just started the work with IBM. So we set out to work with this magic sample, this little yellow glass that you see here, uh, where inside the microcavity there is a oligopolymer, a ladder type polymer, which is called MLPPP. And this material carries excitons, optical transitions, which are resonant to the cavity, but at the same time, it has very strong vibrational modes, the equivalent of phonons in inorganic semiconductors. So because it is a very stiff ladder type polymer, the, vibe, the, 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 the vibrational modes carry a lot of energy. And you can see here in Raman, uh, in, in Raman uh, spectra that the vibronic resonance, they can carry really 164 MeV for one vibron, 200 MeV for another vibron in this track. So we thought that maybe we can actually use these vibrons in the same way that we used a low phonons in inorganic microcavities back in 2010 in order to accelerate the relaxation of polaritons from the external reservoir to the ground polariton state. And this is what we set out to do here. So we inject excitons, one vibron, hot excitons, one vibron above the ground polariton state. And then we are looking here for uh, condensation. We can stimulate this condensation. Uh, so we can create amplification, if you like, by sending few photons which are resonant to the ground polariton state. And now, if we do that and we go for a room temperature all optical transistor, we could show that we have all the characteristics of a, uh, that you would like to have for a transistor. So we have compact optical amplification with the highest ever reported optical gain, so 10 dB per micrometer net gain in the system. Then we could show that we have uh, an ultra fast photonic transistor with the switching on and off in the sub picosecond time scale, so a potential to operate at terahertz speeds. And then uh, we could show that we have a very large extinction ratio, 17 dB. This is a very high extinction ratio when you're looking for the on and off state of your transistor. And then by putting several of these transistors together, we could demonstrate a null optical end and or gate by combining three transistors together. So we were very happy with the results that we got. Uh, but at the same time, there was a use and use review that said, excellent, but without an inverter, without a NOT gate, you cannot have full logic. If you want full logic, you need to have the NOT gate in your, uh, in, in your arm or in your toolbox of gates. And to get the NOT gate, it's very difficult because you would like to switch off a very large signal with a very small signal. So we set out to see if we can really get the NOT gate or really a universal gate like the NOR or the NAND gate, which allows you for full logic. And we did this work by now using the concept of um, non-ground state polariton amplification. So everything I have been talking about so far concerns amplification of the ground polariton state. But imagine now that your, that, your, that your control beam, the seed beam, does not come at the ground state, but it comes at small angle where just angularly you can separate very easily the emission of any light that you get out from this state with respect to what you would get from a polariton condensate. So we go now and you, we cue the vibron, the energy transition that relaxes you from the hot exciton to the seed to be resonant with this non-ground state. And we are looking to see if when we have the seed present, we can get amplification there. And indeed we can get amplification so the characteristics of the system are very similar to that that we have for polarity and condensation. So we have non-linear emission. We have a collapse of the full width of maximum. We have an energy blue sheet. But now we are on a non-ground state. And the, the idea here is the following. 
can we use this to, to, to engineer the first not gain? So when you pump in the absence of the control D, you want to have a compensated K equal to zero at the ground state. And then when you put the seed in there, you want to have amplification that quenches your condensate. So that would be your not gain. So let's see. So here, what we are doing, we have a pump in the absence of a seed. Yes, the pump gives you some light at K equal to zero. And this is the output of your gate, of your not gate here. So when there is no seed, zero, zero input, you have one output, you get the condensation. And then when you put the seed in there, ideally you would like to have zero as an output. So to quench completely off your condensate. And here you can see what is happening in the emission from the condensate as we increase the seed fluence. We can really have something like a factor of 40 extinction ratio. That is actually a very good extinction ratio to separate between one and zero. So by using the concept of non-ground polariton amplification, we have shown that we can engineer the not gate. But uh, why not to utilize the fact that you know the, the, the polariton dispersion, it is uh, actually two-dimensional. You have a paraboloid. So let's see if we can go on the same transistor to put inside to engineer the not gate. So the idea here is that uh, you have you, you come with two control beams with each one at opposite way back. So at plus K and minus K. So let's look at the, at the tooth table of the north gate here. So if I have zero input, I have an output which is the polariton condensate. And when I have one seed coming in, I switch off the output. You can see here actually in the dispersion that there is no emission anymore from the ground polariton state. All the light comes out there. If I have the opposite control beam, again, I switch it off. And if I have both of them together, again, I switch off the emission from the condensate. So this is nothing else but the two input not gate. Yeah. But again, our polarity expression is not just a parabola, it is a paraboloid. So maybe we can put in the same transistor a multi-input not gate, something that would require n minus for every input, you would have n minus one transistors in an electronic transistor where you have where you would like a multi-input not gate. So what I, what I showed you earlier is that uh, this is with the two inputs, where again, I have a very nice extinction ratio from the ground polarity state. And now I can go on and use the fact that I have the paraboloid, where I can bring multiple seed beams all at the same energy, but at different in-plane wave vectors, but not just in one direction of the cavity, but in two directions of the cavity, Kx and Ky. And if I do that, I, I would like practically here, I have put something like eight, Inputs, yes, in the absence of all the inputs, I get the emission from k equal to zero. This is the output of the not gate. And if I have, and you can see in our paper, any number of inputs or all of them together, you get a very nice extinction ratio. So in one and single transistor, we have gone from demonstrating the first not gate to the not gate to a multi input not gate that would require, in this case, at least seven transistors to come together with other techniques, yes, by coupling different not gates together. Uh, do you need to maintain the seed uh, um, uh, laser always there, or you just set the pulse? And yes, it is a pulse. So you set the pulse. Uh, it is it is like a pump probe. Yes. So you have the pump, which is non resonant. It injects a hot exit on one vibrator above the seed state. Yes. And then you crank up the pump power several pulses. You get polarity condensation at k equal to zero. And then when you send a seed pulse. Mm -hmm. uh, at zero time delay with the pump out, mm -hmm. then you, you you can see that you're switching off the compensate at k equal to zero. Right. Okay. And so then it becomes, I mean, you switch on and it remains forever on, you switch off and it remains forever on. So as long as the seed is there, coincident uh, simultaneously <laughs> with, the, with the pump out, it is off and then it is on. Of course, in organic microcavities, all the experiments are done in the pulsed regime. And the reason is that if you go into the CW regime, you generate polarons which are creating dissipated channels for the actions of the system. So all work in organics or any kind of organic laser, it is actually um, in the past. Okay, so- Pavlos, Pavlos, could you also comment on the mechanism of this switch? Because uh, it was somewhat unclear in the course of presentation. Actually, I have not uh, understood why this switch uh, takes place actually. Why the switching takes place? So, uh, let me go a few slides back where I have a dispersion because it would be much easier for me to explain here on the dispersion. 
Right. So if I have a pump pulse only coming on the sample, which is non-resonant to the ground polariton phase, we get the emission from k equal to zero, which you see with red, and this is the polariton condensate. Now, if I put a seed pulse simultaneously on the sample with the pump pulse, and the seed pulse comes at some k vector minus two uh, inverse microns in the image that you see here, then we, what we have, what we saw here is that the seed pulse, which is minuscule, you wouldn't be able to see the seed pulse by itself, the seed pulse is getting amplified. And this amplification is actually uh, driven by the fact that we have tuned the energy position of the seed to be one vibron above the hot excitant. So you have from the hot excitant that the pump injects, a very efficiency single particle energy relaxation channel to the seed. And that practically the seed stimulates relaxation of excitons from the hot excitant to the polariton. Uh, uh, so you use uh, the very same mechanism of uh, bosonic stimulation as uh, was uh, previously demonstrated for polaritons in the region exactly, of this. Exactly. The, okay. In the absence of the seed, you get polariton uh, uh, stimulation to form the ground polariton state. In the presence of a seed, and we have tuned the seed resonant to the vibron, this channel is more efficient than polariton condensation. And actually, mm -hmm. we have. Uh, in the manuscript, we have developed a microscopic theoretical uh, uh, model, which we published actually in 2022 in a feature of letters, which shows actually the different, the thermal, how, how this vibron competes with thermalization. If thermalization was more efficient than this vibron channel, then what you would get is that whatever you put here would thermalize back to the ground state. But if this vibron relaxation mechanism is more efficient than the thermalization, then you can get this non ground state. Uh, amplification. So the mechanism is once you have it working, it is pretty apparent, but it does not always work. It does not work for all structures. You need to be able to have a vibron which is as efficient uh, and as high energy as in this structure. So, uh, is is uh, the nonlinearity due to interaction somehow important here? Or it's just purely this uh, uh, effect due to stimulated scattering. Uh, the, 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 there is uh, there is uh, the interaction of the vibron with the exciton, yes, which drives this channel, and uh, that, that induces into the system a strong nonlinearity. You don't have nonlinearity due to polariton polariton interactions here because we could have... could, no, could nonlinearity be responsible for the stabilization of this uh, state and this uh, upper uh, energy uh, energetic state. The, the thing is that this is, a, you know, the, the measurement that you see is a time integrated measurement over thousands of pulses. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, really, when the pulse is there, you get the switching on, and practically after that, everything decays. But uh, when the two pulses are simultaneously on the sample, you get this amplification of the non ground state, which is mm -hmm. driven by the exit on vibron on linearity. So if you, if you take into account, for example, the, 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 the Trolley Hamiltonian, and you plug in all the terms that we get from our Raman measurements, then you can really reproduce this kind of uh, effect that we saw here. Okay, so, thank you. I can send you the preprint. Okay, so moving on, uh, we have shown that we can do uh, the multi input NOR gate. And now the question is can we go towards what it says there for you that you can see? Can we go towards single photon switching? So can we switch on and off this transistor with just one photon? Because really, if you are looking for amplification, yes, uh, for stimulated uh, mechanisms, one is enough, right? Mm -hmm. So here we set out to tune the system for ground state amplification. And uh, we pump again, uh, resonant to the vibro mode, exactly one vibro above the ground state. And we see the ground state. And here you can see, for example, the polarity dispersion, which is actually, you need to believe me, I showed you earlier data. Uh, we are in the condensate regime, but in the absence of a seed. So we pump just at threshold, and this is the polariton emission from the condensate. And I have also multiplied it by a factor of 2.5 for comparison of what you get when you put few photons at the ground state, when you see the amplification. And this seeding due also to the vibron mechanism gives you this very strong amplification. So you can see here that as I have, for example, 26 atojoule, I have huge amplification, four atojoule for the seed pulse, 
some amplification one at the jaw, I still get more than what I get just in the presence of the pump. So practically every time I have a seed that k equal to zero, I get some amplification, which is discernible also at one at the jaw. So you can see here with the black line, the light that comes out, if you like, from the ground state in the absence of the seed. And that one at the jaw, I have quite some contrast. So that set that really to see if we can reduce even further the seed, uh, the number of photons in the seed pulse, and if we would have some discernible contrast for one photon. So this is a very simple experiment to do. If you do time integrated measurements of multiple pulses and you measure the contrast of the spectra that I was showing you earlier, you can see here that when we go from seed energies, which are, which are on the hundreds of hundred joule, down to sub uh, to less than one hundred joule, and we really convert this to the number of photons, we have some discernible contrast that goes down to something, uh, to, well, one point something photons. But these are time integrated measurements. These are measurements which are averaged over thousands of pulses. And of course, when you do that, you cannot talk about single photons because the pulses that you get from the laser, they have a Poisson distribution in the number of photons inside your pulse. So if you really want to be able to show that you can have for a single photon uh, any contrast, you need to go and measure, if you like, uh, you need to use the single shot technique that we developed. So single pulse characterization. So what we are doing now, we have developed a technique that for every pulse that we put on the sample, we can first characterize the pulse and then measure the full dispersion. And then we can extract the contrast of the intensity. So here, for example, at panel A, what you see is the contrast in the absence of the seed with black dots and in the presence of the seed, repeating this over several times. And you can see that there's a very contrast, in the, a very nice contrast in the intensity. And as we start reducing the number of photons inside the seed pulse, the contrast becomes smaller and smaller. But even for down to this point, we still have some contrast difference, some contrast, which is a, fa a factor of 10% uh, contrast. So by doing now some statistics over this, every single pulse characterization, we can collate this data that you see here, which is as a function of the number of photons in the pulses. And you can see that we get down to a contrast of 10% for one photon. And the black dot line is what we really get from our uh, microscopic theory. So we could demonstrate so, 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 so this uh, ground state amplified condensate is thermalized. What, what, what are the statistics? The, no, uh, so, what you have here is number of coincidences. So, every dot is one pulse from the sample. And this is the, the, the amplitude here that you see, the, the y axis, is the intensity that you get from the condensate. Okay, so these are different coincidences. In the black regions, we have actually no seed beam there. So you just get the condensate emission only in the presence of the pump. Then we switch on the seed, and you see here that you have more counts coming out. We switch off the seed, it is reproducible. Yeah, we can go thousands of cycles like that. And for every cycle, we measure every single pulse that reaches the sample. Then we reduce the seed, uh, the number of photons in the seed. We reduce it further and further and further. And when we go down to an average of one photon per pulse, and we do the single pulse characterization technique, and you do your statistics right, then what you see is that actually you can reach a contrast of 10% down for one photon seeding the condensate at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can we take a single photolimeter? This is, this is something which is uh, actually, even for, for, for different systems that work with single photons, they are using exactly the same technique. We use the technique that people use for ions, atoms, etc. Uh, if you if you have a single photon emitter, uh, there are issues with synchronizing the source, mm -hmm. the laser and the single photon emitter. But we are actually working on this for things that will come later. So I will wrap up what we have done here. Uh, we have shown that we can switch this optical transistor with one photon, that we can make gates and universal gates out of that. However, we have uh, some challenges. And the challenges are to make it, uh, to, to scale it up, if you like. And to scale it up, uh, it is the work that goes beyond a physics lab like uh, ours in Moscow. We are working now with a German company, AMO and uh, IBM, where we are working towards microcavities, which are not planar microcavities that we are used to, but they are lateral microcavities. 
So the cavities are imprinted on the plane of a substrate. So you have lateral microcavities in which you get condensate. And then within these lateral microcavities, you can practically realize several condensates within the plane of the structure. And you can couple them with uh, wave guiding. So this is work now for scaling up the number of transistors and really creating the first processors with, uh, with, uh, with uh, polarity uh, transistors. So we have a European project on this, uh, which is actually going very well. So for this first part of the work, uh, I would like to thank Yuri Lozavik for the theoretical support of the work, Ulisev, who is the chemist that produced this uh, MLTPT, the oligopolymer, uh, the ladder type uh, polymer, which uh, has this very strong vibronic modes, which are essential for what I have shown. The group, Rainer Mark, Thilo, and the students who fabricated these structures, the organic microgravities, and members of the group here with Anton Zasedatele back here, who was Anton Zasedatele and Yagaparov uh, and Baranikov, uh, the people who really uh, uh, worked so hard in the lab to achieve this result. So the next part of the of the talk, I will be talking about simulators. How much time do I have? Half an hour. Half an hour. Yeah. So uh, the concept of simulator, most of you know. For those that do, that do not know, well, let's talk about the antiquity mechanism. The first simulator reported in antiquity. It was Greek, of course, uh, as goes with the speaker, uh, and it was nothing else but a problem-specific solver. So they were using this antiquity mechanism. Uh, in all, they were giving some input from astrological, from astronomical uh, observations, and they could use it for navigation, the ancient Greeks. And this was actually discovered near the Antikythera Island. And when people did some very fancy X-ray tomography, they realized that this is an orrery. An orrery is something that mimics the position of the solar system, the, the movement of the planets in the solar system. And when they made X-ray scans of this, they saw that actually it's a very complex mechanism. That was very accurate. You could, uh, could predict the position of the planets that they use for navigation. But one has to understand that when that was done, there was no knowledge of Newton's or Kepler's law, right? There was no analytical solution to the problem. They had made the device that was mimicking the Hamiltonian of the motion of the planets in the solar system. And that is the concept of a simulator. You don't have the algorithmic, if you like, solution, but you are mimicking the Hamiltonian of the system and you are using this in order to get here the, the, the navigation. So nowadays, these kind of simulators, they go for any problems that are going beyond uh, algorithmic computation. So when you have the number of variables in your problems increasing, the worst case complexity uh, of the system is going to something which is completely not addressable even with the fastest supercomputers that we have. And for this kind of problems, uh, what, you, what you do is you use a simulator. And the most uh, common approach for a simulator is that you are using a spin model. So here I have, for example, in the bottom right corner, a chain of spin ups and spin down, or the Ising chain, if you like. And what you do in order to find optimum solutions to these very complex problems, you map the degrees of freedom to spins, you map the cost function to a Hamiltonian, to the spin Hamiltonian that you are using, and then you have to be able to control the couplings between the individual spins. This is what most people forget. It is not enough to have a lattice of spins. You need to be able to control the individual couplings. If you don't control the individual couplings, it's just a toy model. Okay. So there are different platforms for simulators and quantum simulators. What we proposed a few years ago was a semiconductor based platform for light and boson cyclone state. We're all also at the, uh, a year earlier before I had put, uh, we had really started working on this. Uh, there was the first demonstration of electrical pumping of polarity condensates. So, what is the advantage of polarity condensates for simulators? They give you direct access to all the properties of the condensate through photoluminescence, and therefore you can measure without disturbing the system energy, momentum, spin, and phase. All right. So this is a very nice system, and as I showed, we can get polarity condensates also at room temperature. So it has some advantages in that way as well. So how do you find the ground state of the cost function? The cost function is the problem that you're trying to solve. There are different ways. If you look in a very simplistic way at the energy landscape of the Hamiltonian that describes your system, you are looking for the ground state. If you go through thermal annealing, you need to heat up 
particles that you throw randomly on this potential landscape and hope that they will actually come and find the ground state. However, through thermal annealing, what you could get is that this barrier that I show here could be higher than the excitation from the ground state to the next excited state. Therefore, with thermal annealing, you cannot get practically the solution. You would require to have quantum tunneling, so you cool your system down, and you would hope that actually the height and the width of the barriers would be narrow enough so that your particles can tunnel through, and in this way, you can find your ground state. As you understand, that is also wishful thinking because the next excited state could be a mile away on this axis, yes? And therefore, tunneling from the next excited state to the ground state to take the, time, the lifetime of the universe. So quantum tunneling would actually work for a very small uh, range of problems where excited states are, and uh, the nearest uh, state to the ground state, they are very near to the ground state in this potential landscape. So there is another way to do that, and it is relying on bosonic stimulation. So imagine now that instead of throwing particles inside this potential landscape, what you are doing, you are pumping up particles inside the system to the point that you hit bosonic stimulation. And when you hit bosonic stimulation, you will hit bosonic stimulation. You need to have a system that you will bring bosonic stimulation for uh, the, 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 the highest gain or the minimal losses will correspond to the ground state of this spin model. And that was shown uh, some time ago for the Eisen spin model of coupled OPOs, work that was pioneered by Yagafarov. And as I will show you, we managed to demonstrate this popularity on lattice. So instead of having a milli, we have bosonic stimulation. Imagine if you want to see it to, Im to image, uh, to, 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 to see it uh, pictorially, imagine that you have the Sahara Desert and that you're looking at the deepest deep uh, pit in the Sahara Desert. Uh, you, if, you, if, if you go, you, you would need to go and measure every pit of the Sahara Desert, or you can fly on top of the Sahara Desert and start raising some water under the Sahara Desert. When you will see the first reflection of light from your plane, it is actually from the deepest pit. So that is the equivalent. We raise the number of particles, and the first time that we will hit bosonic stimulation, we will be at the ground state, and that's where we will see light coming from. So common spin models, most of the people are familiar with the Ising model, where I arrange my spins, which are discrete up and down in a checkerboard configuration, and I need to be able to control the couplings. The couplings of its nearest neighbor spin, okay? Now there's another spin model, the XY model, where now the spins are again arranged in a checkerboard configuration, but they're continuous variables. So this is the spin down on the top left, on the bottom right is the spin up, and the spin is like the dial of the watch, so you can have anything between zero and two pi. Now the Hamiltonian looks actually very similar, but I have here the cosine of the angle difference between the two. And again, I would need to be able to control the coupling. So going from everything that we discussed for one condensate, now we are moving therefore to at least two condensates because I need to be able to have two and control the coupling between the two and measure the relative phases. And the work that I will be talking about now is done in inorganic microcavities at cryogenic temperatures under non resonant pump. <laughs> okay, so here you can see, for example, that if I inject inside the system two polariton condensates, and the red here you see the emission, the bright emission of polariton condensates at normal instance from the sample, and I play with the separation distance, I see fringes. And these fringes, they tell us nothing else that, than that I have some coherence, some phase relation between the two condensates. And the phase relation is changing as I change the separation distance. So if I am to map, for example, um, spins to the relative phase here, in order to have a dark notch, I would need to have what phase difference? Pi. Pi. Very good. And here to have a bright notch, I would have zero. And here pi again. So what we can do, we can map spins to the phase of the condensates. And if I do that, this is the configuration that I get here. So this is some initial work that we did back in 2016 in collaboration with uh, Alexei and Yuri Rubo, where we actually understood how the different phase configurations play with the separation distance. And then we built on the potential to optically imprint polariton condensates. We map the phases to classical spins. And then we develop techniques that allow you to play with arbitrary geometries. 
and you can optically read out the solution of the problem. So here you just rely on the interference of the density, but you can also do interferometry. Uh, and we develop ways to control the government. So is it correct to call this problem phase zero schemes? Because in addition to the phase degree of freedom, they also have the degree of freedom for uh, the number of particles. So it's the length of the scheme vector here. Right. So here, what you see is that what we are doing, we are controlling the relative pumping so that we have the same density for each of these condensates. So they are all at the same energy. If they are not, if they don't have the same number of particles, it's condensate. Then, due to the blue shift, you will have different energies. They wouldn't actually couple. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here, you need to be able to control not just the position where you pump, but also the relative pumping, and you equalize them so that you bring the two condensates of the same energy. And then, of course, you will see that they are coupling with each other. Okay. So, how do they couple with each other? We need to understand the mechanism of that. So imagine that I have just one condensate. So if I pump one condensate here, what happens is that where I pump, and I pump non gradiently, I create an exciton reservoir, which creates a potential landscape on which polaritons accelerate. Yes, so polaritons from the top of the potential landscape, they will convert potential energy to kinetic energy, and they will run away. So they will ballistically expand, yes, cylindrically around each condensate. So if I look now at the real space, for example, of the condensate here, and then I extract the intensity profile, I see an exponential decay. If I look at the reciprocal space, I see that I don't have the condensate at the ground state anymore, but I have a ring. This means that within the lifetime, most polarities manage to acquire an in-plane momentum of Kc. So now the condensate ballistically expands with this wave vector. And if I take a profile, you see that this is a very sharp wave vector. So if I look at the dispersion, the condensate now is emitting light at plus minus k vector. So the condensate ballistically expands. And uh, OK, the cylindrical expansion follows the Hengel function. But the point here is that uh, the condensate, well, the way that we imprint it, and by controlling the width of the external reservoir, we can control the wave vector. So we can control how fast it expands. So if we measure, for example, the phase, yes, doing interferometry, and this is experimental data, everything that you see here, the phase you see this beautiful concentric ring. What does it mean? That you have a cylindrically expanding wave, yes? So it is a very, very nice system of a cylindrically expanding wave, which allows you now to couple remote condensate. So if I have a condensate at my place and another one where the camera is, they will be talking to each other, and I can control the speed of the expansion by controlling the size. So this is what we used, and we build up some initial lattices of uh, square lattice, triangular lattice of polyton condensates. And what you see here is the with black is the high intensity. So different configurations for different separation for different lattice constants, different uh, type of lattices, so square lattice, triangular lattice, a graph, something which is actually displaced. And what we did here, we we measured the phase of each individual condensate. And what we could show is that the phase that each condensate acquires, if you map it on the spin, it minimizes the XY Hamilton. So practically, you can use a lattice of polarity condensates to minimize the XY Hamiltonian, which is a spin model. OK. So then we set out to see from this first data, for which I was actually very happy at the time. I did it myself in the lab. <laughs> but it looks pretty dirty if you look at it, yes? So I thought that maybe we can do better. We can build be, be better and bigger lattices. So we set out here in Scoltec to build bigger lattices. So we can really now go up to 1,000 uh, uh, condensates. Uh, and here you see an example of a few hundred condensates in a square lattice configuration. And what you see is that you have interference fringes in the density. And here, what I will be doing, I am ramping up the pump power. So you see that in the far field, you start something which is from something that is incoherent. And as I ramp up the pump power, black peaks appear in the far field, which means that there is coherence across my lattice. OK, that's very nice. So how do we imprint these lattices? Well, we use spatial light modulation techniques. So we bring the non resonant laser on the spatial light modulator. We create a hologram that in reciprocal space corresponds to this lattice. We project this hologram onto the plane of the cavity, 
and in this way we inject the large disease. An important point here for those who are trying to do this kind of measurements is that on the way before the sample, we have a peak of, uh, uh, we have, we detect the emission in reflection or in transmission, but we are also recording the relative intensities of the condensate and we use it to give feedback to the spatial light modulator. So here you can see an example of nine condensates, which are actually moving at a video rate. Yeah. So you have a system where you can program where you would like your pumps to be. These are the pump laser, and this is the condensate, and you can make them dance, right? And the thing is that here, all the densities are the same. The way that they are the same is that we have feedback, nonlinear feedback from the polarity on laser. Yes, so we do not control just, the, we don't control only the intensity, the, the intensity of the laser. We have feedback from its condensate, which we bring back into our algorithm and control the hologram to, to, to bring all the condensate to be at the same. Density, not of the pumping layer. Okay, so by using these, these are not experimental data, these are not theoretical data, these are not numeric. This is experiment what you see here, yes? So you can see nearly perfect. Now I'm happy actually with the results that we are getting from the lab. So these are different type of lattices with the interference ranges that we get when you perfect this technique. And several reviewers actually, they sometimes comment and they say that we do post processing. Okay, the video. Very good. Nice to see you. Anyway. Thank you. Sorry about the alarm. No problem. Uh, so here, what we have is really polariton lattices. Yes, uh, experimental polariton lattices in different configurations using this kind of lattice stability. So we can perfect the lattices. We can perfect where we put them, and therefore we can measure also the phases, etc. But as I said, the most important thing is to control the coupling. If you want to control the coupling, what you want to do is you either move the lattice, you start moving the condensates around, playing on the fact that the coupling is changing as we change the separation distance, but then you would be going around like Sisyphe. By the time you close the loop, you have changed the, the position of the first condensate, and that would be, uh, that, that, that is not a method really to achieve. What you would like to do is to be able to inject, for example, two condensates, and have a barrier in between the condensates, which <laughs> controls the flow of polarity. So if I have a potential barrier, which I can inject optically by inducing an external reservoir, then I can control the coupling between the two condensates. And I need to keep this barrier below condensation threshold so that I don't get another condensate here and just impede the motion of polarity from one condensate to another. So in order to engineer this, we developed a technique which brings now a second spatial light modulator, which inject barriers between condensates. Okay, so let's see. Here you have the pumping profile, two pump, you pump two condensates and we can tune the height of the barrier. This is also a non resonant beam, but below threshold. Here you can see the real space of the condensates. And the most important thing is the relative phase. So again, these are uh, experimental results. Yes. Uh, so here you see that by changing the barrier height, we can switch the system from ferro to anti ferro configuration. All right. And you can see the mode that we deal with, etc. But well, well, so I have a question. Yes. Uh, if um, a condensate is an expanding um, circular wave, yes. then why do you have a constant period of these fringes of the phase? Uh, so uh, the, the wave vector of uh, polaritons increases. Uh, with oh, no. the radial distance. Uh, I, I would have to go back, but actually I can show you here why that doesn't happen. Within the polariton lifetime, as polaritons convert potential energy to kinetic energy, they acquire a well-defined wave vector. So when you look in Fourier space, where you see the wave vectors, you see that our condensates, forget the fringes here, the condensates, they define a well-defined ring. So they do not continuously accelerate because they also have a finite lifetime. Okay, so the process of conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy takes place somewhere in the close vicinity of the center of this uh, ring. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that gives really the well-defined wave vector, which is very mm -hmm. small. So now you have 
collagens which expand with a fixed wave vector, the wave vector that you see in the Fourier space, these are experimental data, and therefore you have these two cylindrical waves. Now, okay. Okay. the motion between them, you can control the relative phase. So now we have a technique to control the couplings of individual uh, pairs of condensates, and we build this beyond. So we went to four condensates, for example, removing the coupling between diagonals so that we have all the same coupling. And we could show that we can play with different type of magnetic phases uh, by controlling the height of the barrier. So we could control the coupling. We build this beyond that. So we could show that we can do this for rings of condensate, for bigger lattices of condensate. And therefore, we demonstrated that with this technique where we inject optical, op we optically inject barriers, we can control the coupling from zero to two pi. Yes. So the relative phase can change from zero to two pi. Okay. So then we use this system to create, as the title of the paper says, a synthetic band structure uh, polariton crystal with non Hermitian topological phases. So practically, you are building now arrays of polariton condensates, but you can play, you can stagger them in different types of configurations. So you can have uh, A, B, A, B, B, A, for example. You can put defects into chains, etc. And we could show that in this way, we can create a, a defect states and play with the non hermitian topological phase of the system. Then we arrange our condensates in rings of uh, polariton condensates. And here you see on the top line, rings of polariton condensates, the bright spots are the condensates, the rest is the fringes. And we increase, for example, here, the number, we go for six to seven condensates. This is the reciprocal space on the bottom line. And here we have extract G1, the phase, let's say, of this condensate. And what you see is that there are configurations when you are in an antiferromagnetically coupled uh, uh, arrangement where practically you go, uh, the, the phase makes a loop and forms a quantized vortex. But this is a big vortex, which is the property not of the condensate, but of the ring of the condensate. So when you go around the loop of the condensate, you fold the phase. They can all be in the same phase, or you can form the phase uh, once from zero to two pi. But we can go also beyond that. And anything in the literature of atomic condensate that has multiplicity more than one <coughs> is called the giant vortex. So we could go to vortices that have plus minus three for the first time, including atomic condensate. So we could demonstrate, for example, giant polariton vortices in uh, rings of condensate. And then we set out to see if we can really create uh, engineer. The, the band structure of the systems. So by imprinting lattices of polariton condensates, we could show that we can really generate now lead lattices and measure the flat bands of the polariton uh, band structures, a very tunable system. Something interesting that appeared actually when we were doing this work is that, uh, okay, we could show, we could demonstrate the flat bands uh, in the condensation state of uh, polariton condensates. But something interesting is that uh, if the lattice constant was very small, the condensates prefer to be where there are no pumping spots. Okay? So for large lattice constants, the condensates are where we pump. And this is everything that you have seen up to now. But there was a configuration where if you look at here, for example, the condensates, the brightest spots are in between the faint rings where we pump. And that set us to look into the potential of creating um, Mm. Of create of injecting now an inverse lattice into which we can realize vortices. So let's see. If I go and I build an hexagon, for example, yes, and I build an hexagon in a configuration, the lattice constant where the condensate will appear in the center, this will be a trap condensate in the center. And then I can build two hexagons which are coupled. Okay. And let's see what happens. If I have the first hexagon, what we see first of all is that. If your hexagon is a perfectly nice hexagon, like the previous data that I was showing you, you get a very nice vortex. So the intensity that comes from the condensate is not Gaussian, but it's a nice vortex state. And when we measure the phase, we see that actually we have a beautiful vortex going either clock or anticlockwise. And in some occurrences, we get a dipole state. So now we have a system which is stochastic. Yes. We have 37% uh, of the time we get an anticlockwise vortex, 45% the clockwise vortex, 18% of the time we get a dipole state. So vorticity for a single cell is actually in a, in a majority of the realization that we get. So we send a pulse, we measure <coughs> what vortex we have, and we see this triangle statistics. 
Now, in the two vortices, in the two cells, what you see is that again, you, you get something that looks like a dipole, but actually there is intensity, there are polarities here away from the lows. And when you record the phase, you see that in most of the cases, we are getting actually antiferromagnetically coupled vortices. So a clockwise and an anticlockwise vortex. And this is a preferred stochastic solution to the problem that we were discussing. And in some small percentage, you get something which is like a vortex and a dipole state. Okay. So really the system of two coupled vortices likes to be in an antiferro configuration. And that is actually now something that uh, which has opposite topological charge with 93% sums. Okay, so this is the preferred state. Uh, now we can go and see what happens when I have three. Well, when I have three, a bit frustration inside the system. If I, ha if I have three vortices, uh, if I have the XY Hamiltonian, of course I could arrange them nicely, but if I have the multiplicity of the vortex, so plus minus one here, well, I have frustration in the system. And when I go and do the, ex the experiment, I see that I have different statistics. So I have 16% of the realizations. I get dipoles. In each trap, there is a nice dipole. Uh, almost 40%, I get two dipoles and the vortex, uh, vortex and the vortex and the dipole, vortex and the vortex vortex. So really a very highly frustrated system. Nothing is changing. These are different realizations for exactly the same pumping condition here uh, for, for the triangular vortex. So yes. Uh, are these stationary solutions, or could it be a single shot kind of uh, screenshot of them uh, evolving? They are stationary solutions because here we are using uh, 20 microsecond pulses mm -hmm. and we are integrating for 20 microseconds. If they were not stationary solutions, in the 20 microsecond excitation, the system would be evolving between different configurations and the integrated intensity over 20 microseconds would not show a vortex, mm -hmm. right? So they are stationary solutions. Of, uh, of a stochastic system, practically, of an unstable system. So now, why, why these vortices would appear at all? What is the mechanism of uh, spontaneous breaking of time reversal symmetry here? Ah, why do you have a vortex forming in this? Yes, because you don't have magnetic field, then. Uh, yes. So, so this is actually, this is, this is the, the lowest energy of the system. So practically, when you have, um, th there are different reasons. So there is a dynamic reason which I can explain from a background semiconductor uh, physics. One is that when you pump is where you inject the exciton reservoir. Okay, mm -hmm. so where you inject the exciton reservoir uh, is not. Uh, let me go one slide back. Two slides back. <coughs> so the the black dots here is the pump. This is where your gain would be in a, in, a, in an optical gain fixer. Yeah. So mm -hmm. a condensate that is situated in the center has less wave function overlap with the gain, which is on the black dots. A ring has actually a much better wave function overlap with the, with the gain region, okay? So a ring is a preferred state, yes? A ring is the first state that you will see condensation because you have higher gain for the ring, so for the vortex. Yeah, state. okay, ring, I can understand that it can form, but why does the vortex of the face appears? Right, and then why, the, because this is actually coming, uh, it appears spontaneously, and it is corresponding to the lowest energy of the system. So we don't have a static ring of the same phase, but we have a vortex where the, the phase goes from zero to two pi or from, uh, or the other way around, yes. Uh, and this is, <laughs> It is uh, not safe. You you get this kind of spontaneous vorticity in any kind of superfluid, yes? Yeah, but it is usually an excited state. Oh, but here it is an excited state as well, if you like, but it is the uh -huh. state that carries the highest gain. So it is the first state that we mm -hmm. made. So I will show you later how we can go from this, from the vortex, how we can bring the system to the Gaussian condensate inside the trap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quantum uh, numbers, the, the explanation would be that if you have imagine a two, two dimensional hydrogen atom, you have one S state, but it has no overlap with pump. You have two S state, also not good. Then you have two pi X and two pi Y. It is already better, but the best of all would be the linear combination two pi X plus plus or minus I two pi Y. And this corresponds to two vortex solutions. It has the best overlap with, uh, with the pump. With the gain medium. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So you get these vortices. And as I said, the <laughs> condensates appear inside the pumping spots. They are trapped condensates for small lattice constants. If you have larger lattice constants, the condensates appear on the pumping spots. But the condensate, the, 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 the ring, the, the vortex, is actually the, 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 the state that carries the highest uh, gain. So now we expand beyond just the couple once we understand how two and three work. And we built here 21 uh, traps. 22. 22, okay, 22 traps. Uh, and then uh, what we see here is that when we do this, for a small lattice constant, for a, for, for a very small, for a very large lattice constant, we get uh, the, the condensates appearing where we pump. We pump with these dust rings, yeah? If I decrease the lattice constant, then actually what you see is that you get the condensates appearing as vortices inside the rings. And the interesting thing here is, are all these vortices or are they just rings as you just said, uh, Sergei? So to, 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 to understand what we have, you can measure first of all the Fourier space and you see that you have a ring, a circulating ring. So you have a current going around. And then we can do also the interferometry and when you do the interferometry, you see that in most of the traps, you get actually a vortex. And now these vortices, they are arranged stochastically in different configurations. The interesting thing is that once you understand that in the two vortices, the preferred configuration is the anti-vortex configuration, in a lattice, where now the vortices are spins of plus and minus one, it will be interesting to see if the, con the alignment of the vortices is such that brings them into anti ferro configuration, which <laughs> corresponds to the minimum of the Isaac Hamiltonian. And actually, when we did several realizations of that, we realized that we have the spin configurations that bring you. Uh, <laughs> don't break a leg, it's really hard. <laughs> 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 You're dominating the people here. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so, I'm so <laughs> So we can see on this picture that the number of vortices uh, left hand and right hand is equal, right? So more or less equal. And when you do several realizations, we find actually that the system, the Ising energy of the system, is approaching the ground state of the Ising Hamiltonian that we can calculate with brute force methods. Okay. So it is something like if the I'll give you a number. If the ground state is minus 100 we find that for each realization of lattice vortices, we get between minus 90 and minus 70. Okay, so we are, the system has a tendency to go towards the ground state, still not quite there, but it is moving towards the optimum solution if you like. Okay. Because there is some temperature, some effective temperature. Of course, probably. of course. <laughs> we are not at the absolute zero here. Okay, and now I will move to the last part of uh, the talk, just two slides. Uh, because the chairman here <laughs> is uh, putting some pressure, which really uh, looks at the, uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the following configuration. We saw that we can create spontaneously vortices inside these uh, polariton condensates when we put them in traps. People have observed polariton uh, uh, vortices in, uh, within, the, within a polariton condensate on a single polariton condensate. And the, 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 the question is can we really get uh, quantum vortices in polarity condensates by rotating them because polarity condensates are also superfluid. There has, been, there has been quite some work there. I skip the introduction. But the question is if I could make an experiment where I spin the polarity condensate, like, in, uh, like when you put superfluid helium in a, a rotating bucket, would I get a vortex? And how do you do that when you have a lifetime of a system which is seven picoseconds, a coherence which is one nanosecond? And dynamics, which are really on the sub nanosecond time scale. Yeah. So you would need to rotate them very fast. So, what we did, we developed a technique which takes into account two beams, which are each of them in a vortex configuration. And you can see here, so we have two spatial light modulators. One spatial modulator control, we can control the frequency and the angular momentum of each beam. And when we add them together, we can get this kind of dumbbell which rotates. And the rotation depends on the difference between the angular momentum of the initial beams and the frequency of the initial beams. And when we impose this onto the sample, so when we have a rotating dumbbell of an exciton reservoir, 
and the external reservoir, if you remember, repels polaritons. We were using them for barriers before. What we see is that actually within this ring excitation, which rotates very fast, we get a very nice ring of polariton density. And when we do the interferometry, we see that we have actually a perfect, vor perfect vortex which follows the direction of rotation of the dumped shape of the external reservoir. So it's practically you, you, have, you inject the polariton condensate, which you start spinning it, and as you spin it, it forms a vortex. Now, how fast would you have to spin it in order to form a vortex? If you spin it very slowly, of course, the polaritons do not see anything. And then there are diabatic resin here. You will not get a vortex. You will get a nice Gaussian thing. But if you spin it fast enough, you can control the vorticity just by controlling the relative angular momentum and the frequency difference between the two lasers. So we saw here that by controlling the, 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 the frequency of the two different lasers, we can go from plus to minus vortices, or by keeping the frequency uh, the same, we can play with the uh, angular momentum. Now, the point is the following. Here, what you see, and this is the most important graph, and the smallest one, you see the percentage of vortices occurring as you change the rotation frequency between zero and 10 gigahertz. <clears throat> so by tuning the frequency between the two lasers, you can really have a hook so you can control the speed of the rotation. If you're at zero, you get a nice Gaussian. You don't get a vortex in the center. This is what you see. And as you start increasing and you go above one gigahertz, yes, then you start seeing that vortices appear inside the system. All right. So you move away from the diabatic regime. And then if you start spinning very fast, much faster than the exciton lifetime in the system, now the excitons practically by spinning them so fast, create a very cylindrical profile, which does not rotate anymore the polarity on its edge. So practically, you have created a paddle of excitons. You can rotate, if you rotate it very slowly, slower than the dynamics and coherence, no vortex appears. If you rotate it very fast, so that the lifetime of the excitons is uh, shorter, uh, then you have uh, then you have practically uh, is longer, then you have a very symmetric profile, and again, you don't give any torque to your condensate. So, this is the first demonstration of the rotating bucket experiment, the equivalent with polariton condensates, which was actually it's not submitted anymore. It was published last week in Science Advanced. Uh, right. And on the very last part of the talk, we can, we can rotate. on the very last part of the talk, I will tell you how you can use now these nice lattices of polariton condensate in order to solve some problems which are not interesting just to physicists. Because everything that I have shown you here is that we play with lattices, but we use them as something to study interesting physics. Yeah? So now we set up to go and configure the lattice of the condensate in a way that we can map it to the max 3 cut problem. So the max 2 cut problem was the problem but by using the Ising model, Yamamoto managed to solve, which is the Ising machine. And there is only so much power in the max to cut. What we did here, we discretized the XY model, we projected the spins in a ternary basis, and we used uh, a technique which allows you to do this and practically uh, try to see if we can solve the max three cut problems with, uh, with the polariton lattice. And the first problem that we managed to solve was the so called image segmentation. So, here, what we do, you take an image. You project it in three different planes, the three different colors, and then you apply the max three cut uh, formally. And of course, you have a lattice, which is a, a condensate, a spin at each point of your image, each pixel is a condensate. And then what we managed to show is that actually the system that we, we, we find the, the phase configuration that addresses the max three cut. It will find different regimes, different colors, different uh, characteristics of the image. So here are two examples. If you have an apple, you see here now when you project the lattice of condensate, the phases of the condensate are arranged as such, yes, so that you can you can understand the different parts of the of the of the image. So you see here the tree here, everything that is green, the spins mostly point in one direction, etc. Now someone would say, uh, why do you do that? We can do it with a computer. Well, the system finds the phases in hundred picoseconds. Your computer does nothing in hundred picoseconds. Yes. 
So you, can, you cannot even start computing in 100 picoseconds. So the system from once we set it, it finds the solution within 100 picoseconds. And with that, I will not go to the next part of the talk. I will conclude. <laughs> Thank you very much all for your attention. Thanks, Paolo. It's so far for the longest talk and the repose of seminars. But it is my first talk since I have almost recovered. <laughs> Not quite, but almost recovered. So uh, I was very keen. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I mean, it's lunchtime, but we still have time for a half or a short question. If any. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll ask the truth. It's short enough. So, is it possible to uh, deliver some torque to the condensate? by exciting the reservoir with the Lagier Gauss B? Uh, we try. And there is actually a paper uh, which uh, the, there is a PRL from a Korean group that they try to do that. Uh, it is uh, no, the answer is no. <laughs> so the first thing, because what we have here is Lagier Gaussian beams. Yeah. So when we have Lagier Gaussian beams, uh, we, we combine two to create this damper. Of course, we did the experiment with one Lagrange Gaussian and of different uh, degrees of uh, angular momentum. And there is no actually, uh, statistically, you may see some vortices, but it is not uh, statistically significant. Okay. Where here, with this dumbbell configuration that we rotate the X to the polarity condensate, the, con the vortex is 100%. It's deterministic. Yes, there is no statistics. Every time we pump, we will see a vortex. So what, what was the mechanism you used to explain? Uh, this transfer of torque. This transfer of it is the repulsion from the external reservoir. Okay, so regular vortices. Yes, yes. Just okay, ladies and gentlemen. I believe now we need to to, to, to finish. So just Andre, tell us who is the next speaker. I can say you can know you for sure that uh over twenty two will be Ivan Savinka. Ah Ivan Savinka. Our guest from South Korea. Excellent. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. And let's have a nice, good lunch now. Thank you, colleagues. Very nice to see you. We should be in contact soon. Thanks.